Hey, y'all, you listen to the Gary Owen Podcast. <laughs> Hashtag get some. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is Gary Owen with the uh, Get Some Podcast. You can uh, listen to this on iTunes. Just go to Gary Owen uh, or look for hashtag get some, or you can watch it on YouTube. Go to youtube.com backslash Gary Owen com. Uh, recording this at Timeless R Recording Studio in Cincinnati, Ohio. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube, you can see I'm wearing my uh, Boomer Esiason Bengal jersey because we undefeated. And the last time we went to the Super Bowl was uh, 30 years ago this season. So I'm repping that boomer. I'm going to get into Bengals in a second. I'm going to go over my schedule real quick. It's a minor thing. And then I'll get into the Bengals for probably three and a half hours while we're undefeated. Uh, this weekend, I'm in Tampa, Florida at the Improv, September 21st to the 23rd. Then uh, I'm taking the weekend off after that. My sister's getting married. Uh, and I'm in the wedding. I think she's literally got like nine bridesmaids and groomsmen and her um, husband to be asked to be one of the nine. So I feel special, but not really. That's too many. Let's just be honest. That's when you, that's when you get married in your twenties. You don't want to offend people. When you get married in your thirties and forties, you don't give a shit. You might have one, two groomsmen, but nine. Good Lord. That's all. I don't, I don't have nine friends. I really don't have nine friends to have that many groomsmen, (laughs) but, but it should be a good wedding. Hopefully. Uh, and then I, I'm, I'm back on the road October 5th through the 7th in Richmond, Virginia at the Funny Bone. And then October 13th, I'm in Washington, D.C. at the MGM National Harbor. That's the casino. I'll be there with Lil Rel. Got some stuff to talk about about Lil Rel in this podcast also. Cat Williams, thank you for giving me something to talk about. Uh, then October 18th to the 21st, I'm in Ontario, California. That's in uh, that's a suburb of L.A. It's like 40 minutes east of L.A. In the Inland Empire. Just think uh, next Friday, Rancho Cucamonga, that area. And then October 26th, I'll be in Oklahoma City, Oklahoma, at the Tower Theater with Russell Westbrook. For, uh, he's having a, his charity event um, for the uh, Oklahoma City Thunder. So his people reached out. So I'm actually excited. I've never met Russ. And he's leaving me tickets for the game on that Thursday, October 25th, and they're playing the Celtics. What a great game. I don't know if I'm courtside. Let's hope. Uh, That's going to dictate how I feel about Russell Westbrook, that game right there. If he's got me in nosebleeds, I'm going up on, man, fuck Russell Westbrook. I can see why Kevin Durant left. Now, if he's got me courtside, I'm like, man, fuck Kevin Durant. Man, he should have never left. (laughs) So how I feel about Russell Westbrook, it's all going to be where my seats are that game. Uh, and then I'm getting way far down the line. But uh, New Year's Eve, I'll be in uh, Dallas, Texas, like I am every New Year's Eve at the Verizon Theater. And then I'm coming home to Cincinnati, Ohio, December 15th at the Taft Theater. Tickets go on sale this week. Cincinnati, Ohio, Taft Theater, December 15th. Yes, it's Saturday. Uh, speaking about Cincinnati, it's a good time. To be recording this in Cincinnati, Ohio. We undefeated. Bengals are 2-0. and It's just good. Everything, everything in life is good right now. Like literally my doctor would be like, Gary, you got cancer. You got six months to live. It's better than five. That's what I would say. Hmm. Better than five months. Uh, <laughs> I hate it when you uh, when you try to pump up your own team. Be like, we undefeated, baby. We undefeated. And you always got those haters. Be like this. Oh, uh, till this week. Till this week. Well, it ain't this week, motherfuckers. It's now. We undefeated right now. Uh, Let let me run down the undefeated teams right now in the NFL. Because there's nine of them. Uh, Miami Dolphins are undefeated. I don't think too many people really think the Miami Dolphins are that good. Uh, Even though they've had a couple good wins. um, The Bengals, I'm sure a lot of people feel the same way about the Bengals that I kind of feel about the Dolphins, like, ah, Jacksonville, real deal. That's the real deal. You're going to have to – the only way to beat Jacksonville, especially in the AFC, and I think they're the favorites right now to come out of the AFC, is you can't turn the ball over. You got to have ball control, and and that's tough against that defense. And uh, that's about it. You just got to hold no turnovers. And, and, you know, I think Blake Bortles is uh, – He's a good quarterback. He's not a great one, 
But for that system, for that type of team, he's good for them. Uh, it's funny how now they're undefeated and Blake Bortles is, is slinging the rock to a bunch of wide receivers I've never heard of. That, this, this one guy last week's out of Kentucky Wesleyan. I was like, where the hell did this dude come from? Undrafted free agent. That's crazy. And, and, but now everybody, remember in the offseason, everybody's like, they should get Case Keenum or there was small rumblings about Andy Dalton or Kirk Cousins. And now everybody's like, no, we're cool with Blake. Uh, I like watching Jacksonville play. That defense is this, they talk shit. They hawk. I just, I like watching them play. Uh, Kansas City's undefeated. I think they're the real deal. Uh, Denver, I think Denver is in that Cincinnati, the Miami uh, boat. Like, unless you're in Cincinnati and you're from Cincinnati, unless you're in Miami, you're from Miami, nobody really thinks Denver is is scary like that. But, you know, Case Keenum, everybody thought when he left Minnesota, you know, that was going to be, uh, <clears throat> he's going to cost some games, but he's had two comeback wins, man, against Seattle and, and Oakland. So those are the, what is that, one, two, three, four, five undefeated teams in the AFC. So you really look at, I would I would say Jacksonville and Kansas City are the ones everyone's taking notice of the most. <clears throat> I think Miami, Cincinnati, and Denver, it's like a wait and see right now. Sorry, I got a, a frog in my throat. Uh, <clears throat> in the NFC, undefeated teams, now, I don't know if you consider this undefeated. Green Bay and Minnesota, because they both got ties. They tied each other. And then you got Tampa, which also I think is, people say, you know, unless you're from Tampa, I don't know. I don't think people were too threatened by the Buccaneers. And then then you got the Rams. Sorry about that. Man, the Rams look like the motherfucking team. They have no weaknesses. They just, they got, uh, Todd Gurley's the real deal. They got a great offensive line. The defense is stacked. They got DBs. They got defensive linemen and Dominican Sue and Aaron Donald. And there's just no weaknesses. Uh, they scare me the most. So I think in the NFC, I think everyone right now would be like Falcons and Rams. I'm not Fal- I'm sorry, sorry. I'm, I don't know what I'm thinking. I think the Vikings and Rams are definitely the two favorites. And then you got the Eagles with Carson, Carson Wentz coming back this week which is freaking huge for them. So, I mean, a lot of things are going to play out this week. Here's the thing. The Monday night game coming up this week is Pittsburgh and Tampa. Now, Tampa's undefeated. Pittsburgh looks like they're in disarray. Le'Veon Bell hasn't reported. Antonio Brown got in a Twitter, not argument, but one guy said on Twitter, Antonio Brown owes most of his success to Ben Roethlisberger. It wasn't for Ben. Antonio wouldn't have the stats or the career that he has. And Antonio went, well, trade me and let's find out. And I was like, ooh. And then uh, every time you think Pittsburgh's in disarray and their season's going down the tube, and then you get a game like this where you got Tampa coming in, feeling good about themselves and undefeated and slinging the ball. I mean, Ryan Fitzpatrick is slinging the ball all over the place. And then everybody's like, well, yeah, so Pittsburgh should be not going to beat Tampa. This is the game Pittsburgh will win. It's the game, and, and they, they got to go to Tampa. It's just, I've seen it too many times. I never count Pittsburgh out. They always go on a run. I remember the year they went to the Super Bowl back in 2005. And I go to the damn game. Oh, my gosh. It, it's, it hurts right now to talk about. Bengals beat them. So, so it looked like Pittsburgh was out of it. I think they were 7-5 and five at that point. And they end up winning their last five games, or last, yeah, four or five, last five games. They go 11 and five. They get in the playoffs. They're the last seed, sixth seed. And that's where they hit Carson Palmer, Kimo von Ohlhofen, hits Carson Palmer. Carl Palmer goes out. That's the year the Bengals had the Steelers' number. I really think they had their number. And then they go to Indy. They beat Indy. And then they beat Denver. And I'm like, man. Just when you thought they was out of it, you know, they they come back and they they go on a run like they do every year. And I think this is the week though they're gonna beat uh, they're gonna beat the Bucks. I hope I'm wrong. God, I hope I'm wrong. But if you're gonna ask me, I would I would pick the Steelers over Tampa Bay. I just seen it too many times. Just when you think the Steelers are gone and they're down and out, 
They 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 do this shit. I'm gonna be rooting for Tampa Bay like no other. And I'm not just saying that because I'm going there. I'm going there this week, and I know the city's gonna be on fire and it's gonna it's feel good vibes and everything. But I've seen it too many times, man. Now the Bengals go to Carolina, and I'm just looking at Carolina like at the beginning of the year, I would say this is a game the Bengals will lose. Now I say it's a good shot we we could win that game because I mean, I'll be honest with you, Cam doesn't have a lot of wide receivers. He's kind of on the run. The offensive line's beat up. Uh, and the, you know, with the Bengals, with Joe Mixon being out is huge, I think. Everybody's like, well, that's not a big deal. I said, I don't think you realize. A couple of his runs last week, the Bengals' left side is fine of their offensive line. It's the right side that's weak. But Joe Mixon has an ability to cut back. There was a couple runs, especially in the fourth quarter. He had one where they were trying to steal the victory. He went to the right side. He stopped cuts back, goes all the way left side, and he gets like a 20-yard gain. And it put him right in field goal range. It was for a first down. I was like, not everybody can do that. I'm I'm, I'm, I'm excited to see what the young running backs are going to do because I think Giovanni's a, a durable, good back. You know, he's going to have a couple runs where he's going to break. But uh, and, and the young guys, the Trey Carsons, and we'll see what they do, man. I mean, uh, I hope. I can hope, but th- now I now I feel like we got a really good chance of beating Carolina. Where at the beginning of the season, I would say I would have probably picked Carolina, but now, ah, oh, be a great time for three and zero. Ah, what's weird is both Bengals games they won thirty four to twenty three, both games. I don't think that's ever happened. You win both games at the beginning of the year with the same score. Uh so I don't want people to take my joy this week. I hate I hate it when people do that shit. I'm like we're undefeated. Till this week, get ready for that big L. Fuck that. We're undefeated now. That's what I'm talking about. Right now, we undefeated. Uh, other big news in the NFL is Cleveland Browns. God, they trade Josh Gordon away to New England. And as soon as I heard them said they're going to release or trade Josh Gordon, I go, he's going to New England. There went a doubt in my mind. There was rumors he might go to San Francisco. I said, nah, that dude's going to Cleveland. I mean, that that dude's going to New England. Without question. And sure enough, two days after it got, it hit the airwaves, Browns are going to release Gordon. They're going to trade him. New England gets it for their fifth round pick. I'm like, saw it coming. And Josh Gordon is one of those guys, when he's healthy, he doesn't need a lot of practice time. He just got, Tom Brady's got to be ecstatic because he makes white guys look really good. Now he's getting a stud wide receiver. He ain't had a wide receiver like this since uh, Randy Moss. As far as just natural athletic ability, he ain't had one like this. And everyone I've talked to that's ever played with Josh Gordon was like, dude, that dude's head on straight. He's the best in the NFL. And now New England's got him. You know, ah, I say you know a lot. I've, I've, I picked that up on my podcast, though. That's my, that's my filler word when I'm thinking about something else to say. You know, you know. I, I hear Adrian Broner talk a lot, the boxer. And every time he does an interview, he goes, you know, man, at the end of the day, this is what it's all about, man, at the end of the day. Whether he wins or loses, Bro- when Broner loses, I- how do I go from-, from football to boxing? I don't know, but I just did. When Angel Broner loses, that's what he goes to when when <laughs> when they be interview him. At the end of the day, man, I'm still AB. I still look good. And I'm still one of the best. Yeah, I'm about billions at the end of the day. And then when he wins, he's like this. At the end of the day, anybody can get it. At the end of the day. And he says at the end of the day, like I say, you know. Watch any age. Go to YouTube right now. Go to any Adrian Broner uh, interview after a fight. Watch how many times he says, at the end of the day. At the end of the day, I'm still a man. At the end of the day, I still got kids. At the end of the day, I'm still breathing. At the end of the day, you still listen to my podcast. At the end of the day. You know, whether he wins or loses, I just said, you know. See that? That's my go-to word. See? It's funny when you watch yourself and you hear yourself on the radio and you start to critique yourself. I was like, God damn it. I say, you know, a lot. But I don't say at the end of the day, at the end of the day. That's what people always say. At the end of the day, you know, you know, at the end of the day, you know, at the end of the day. Uh, so that's my football rant for this week. Uh, other news. Now, that I'm, I'm going to get into what Cat Williams said on, on V103 here in a second. Uh, but other news was George Zimmerman. I saw this post going around on Instagram constantly the last few days. And it was George Zimmerman. Is now, and I guess it was on. I guess it was part of that that Trayvon Martin um, miniseries on BET, 
where they show what George Zimmerman's doing now. This dude is wearing Confederate flags and he's signing Skittles wrappers, autographing them. And he's also selling paintings of, of Trayvon Martin, uh, dead body in the grass. I don't think I've ever, I, I don't think I've ever felt like anybody was such a piece of shit like George Zimmerman. Yeah. You know, if I just said, you know, again, I just, uh, I was dumbfounded. I did a post on my Instagram page where I said, I've never been in a fist fight in my life. Not a real one, like, like elementary school, high school and stuff like that. I've always had the ability to walk away and I try to defuse situations when it, when it's, when I feel like it's going to get physical. Uh, but this dude, George Zimmerman, there's not a, I, I don't know how I'd feel to be in his presence. All I know is I, I, I'd punch him in the face. I just walk up and punch him in the fucking face. And you just walk away. I just, I've never, I, it's weird, man, to gloat over someone dying. That's just, that's just some low down, low down dirty shit. Uh, a fight that you started by following this kid, uh, a fight that you knew you had a gun. And I, I watched that six part mini series on, uh, on BET. And uh, to me, it was pretty clear what happened in that George Zimmerman case, even though there's no cameras and we got different versions of the story. Uh, to me, it was Trayvon Martin was walking home. George Zimmerman started following him. Trayvon realized George Zimmerman was following him. He steps in a breezeway. George Zimmerman's still looking for Trayvon. Trayvon steps to George Zimmerman's like, hey, man, why are you following me? Then George Zimmerman came back. Why are you in this neighborhood? He goes, and I'm, well, I don't know the words that was exchanged after that. Doesn't matter. All I know is uh, a fight ensued and George Zimmerman had a gun. And he, I, Trayvon Martin was getting the best of him and George Zimmerman shot him. One shot. It wasn't multiple shots. It was one shot. And me being, uh, even though I was a military police officer, I was a police officer. And one of the things we learned in training is when you shoot one time, you're scared. When you unload on somebody, that means you you meant to kill them. You, that, that's the goal. And that's when people say, when, when cops get in conversation with people and I hear people say, why didn't they shoot him in the leg? You, when you pull your gun out, as, as a police officer, you're not pulling out the wound. You pull, you shoot to kill. That's the only reason you're pulling your gun out. It's, it's called escalation of force. And you go, you're supposed to, in your brain, go, you know, talk, nightstick. Uh, now it would be tasers. We didn't have tasers when I was a cop. Tasers and then gun is the last resort. That means when you fear for your life, you feel like your life's in danger. So I think that goes true for anybody. When you start unloading on people, yeah, you meant to kill somebody. When you fire one shot, you were scared. So to me, George Zimmerman fired one shot, and that's what went through Trayvon's heart. He was scared. He was getting his ass kicked. Uh, just take the ass whooping, man. He wasn't. A, uh, and then to just gloat about it, uh, that's, a, that's some low down dirt. And the way he's gloating about it, now, now it's definitely a racial thing with him. Uh, it's just, I've never seen a bigger piece of shit in my life. Take, um, Take Casey Casey Anthony, the one that allegedly killed her child in Florida. Of all places, Florida. I mean, it keeps happening in Florida. Uh, You haven't heard from her since. She is completely off the grid. She's nowhere to be found. Can't find her. Uh, That's what we want from George Zimmerman, you would think. You go through an experience where you kill somebody, just, just go away. Just please go away. I mean, this guy is making money off off him killing a teenage kid. That's just ah, I hit him. I hit him in his fucking face. Not a doubt in my mind. Not a doubt in my mind. The same way that I can restrain myself, and I've always been had an ability to diffuse a situation and walk away when I think things might get physical. And it's not like it happens a lot in my life. Especially the older you get, the less it happens. Uh, it's not. A, it, I I know if I saw him. I know I just walk up and hit him. I wouldn't even say hello or nothing. Wouldn't make a scene, just beep, and just walk away. You know, God damn. He needs his ass whooped bad. Uh, oh, my God. It's disgusting, the, the pictures I see now. 
especially the one where he's smiling, holding up a painting of of a deceased Trayvon Martin in the grass. That's that's some low down dirty. And the people that are buying these paintings just as bad. You some low down dirty motherfuckers too, to 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 go that route. Oh, just disgusting, man. Just okay. Enough on that. Uh, the other news and me being a comedian that that struck me was Cat Williams went on V103 uh, morning show in Atlanta and completely, just no filter, went in on Lil Rel, Gerald Carmichael, uh, Tiffany Haddish, Kevin Hart a little bit. Uh, I, and it's one thing to say you're uh, you're out of line, uh, or to give your opinion. I think with Cat, it was a little bit. Hold on a second. Uh, uh, sh- Sorry, my son's blowing me up. Doing podcast. Sorry about this. That was a commercial break. That's when your son is on the other side of the country and he called you four times while you're doing your podcast and he gives you no five. I just texted him. I'll be done. It's an emergency. He's still calling me. Uh, the, the ADHD runs in my family. I got it. That's why my podcast, I'll be going on rants and then get on another rant. And my son definitely has it too. Like that dude gets transfixed and he will blow me up. And I'm like, what's up? Hey, can you order me some food? <laughs> like what? Yeah. Can you order me some food, dad? Uh, so I um I was talking about Cat Williams. So Cat goes in with with Wanda and 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 he's there's this there's this lady named Wanda Smith and she's been on Atlanta radio for I'm I'm guessing 20 years. Wanda's a very nice lady. And Cat Cat is so I think he's so intelligent and he's so smart. Uh I don't know, some it's it's like I think every genius has a bit of crazy in him. And I think that's what Cat is. I think definitely he's a he's a comedic genius, but he also got a bit of crazy in him. Uh, so he goes in and says uh, he's offended that Tiffany Haddish is that people are calling her the queen of comedy, and she doesn't have enough comedy specials, and she hasn't been on a tour, and things of that nature. And so uh, I see where Cat's going with this, because when you say somebody's the queen of comedy, you're thinking stand up. Where Tiffany isn't known as a stand-up. She's she's pretty much known from Girls Trip, and that's what took her to another level. Very similar to Melissa McCarthy. She's very much become the black Melissa McCarthy. How Melissa McCarthy came in with Bridesmaids. And everybody was funny in that movie, but she clearly stood out. Girls Trip comes out, and to be in a cast with with Queen Latifah, Jada Pinkett, R- Regina Hall, and then Tiffany. And when I first heard about the movie and heard it got casted i thought tip was going to be like supporting then when i saw it i was like whoa no that's her movie you know it's very, it reminded me very much of think like a man where where romney uh when the movie came about romney was going to be the narrator and then it turned into kevin was the kevin ended up becoming the narrator and because kevin just started taking off after we casted it and everything and and now with uh, when I saw Girls Trip, that's that's a Regina Hall was clearly the centerpiece, and it was it was Jada Pinkett, Queen Latifah, and Tiffany revolving around Regina. But Regina was a centerpiece of that movie, but Tiffany was just so wild in it that she stuck out, and then she started just getting offered roles after roles, and that you know, I said you know again, damn it. Uh, so her stand up, she's never been known for her stand up, even though she's been on Dev Jam. And she had a Showtime special and she just signed a deal with Netflix. You know, Kat did say something that was valid. Can you tell me your favorite Tiffany Haddish joke? You can't. Uh, she hasn't done anything in the stand-up realm that has stuck out. Similar to sh- Tiffany was in like, she was in Keanu. She was in uh, the, the the Carmichael show and, and bit parts in other movies. But she didn't do anything that resonated. And really stuck out, which happens a lot in this in this business. Hell, Kev did. Kev was in a long. Kevin Hart was in a long came Polly and and that movie Eddie Murphy Dave Meet Dave and stuff. But really, Soul Plane. Okay, that was that he was the lead, and that became like a a, a hood classic. 
But then Think Like a Man, boom, really blew Kevin out of the water. Uh, Tiffany was the same way. And I think Kat was more saying, stop saying she's the queen of comedy when she hasn't done enough as a stand-up. And there's other people out there, other females out there, like Kat brought up Lunell and Melanie Camacho. Those are people that Kat took on the road. So basically, Kat's basically like, in my opinion, Tiffany's not funny is what he was saying as a stand-up. Uh, but then he, and to me, female comedians, it's tough, man. It's tough. This is a male dominated, uh, business. And I've heard females say being attractive and being a female is a hindrance. Uh, cause it's hard. You see a pretty female, you don't think she's going to be goofy and you're going to laugh like that. Uh, but I like Tiffany a lot. I do. But as far as stand up. You know, I don't I don't think she's the funniest stand-up comedian out there. Uh, but is but I'm not knocking her at all. I mean, to me, the funniest, just in my opinion, the funniest female stand-up is Samore to me. Samore, I've been on the road with her. She always brings it, she's always writing. And I'm like, God, she's really good. She's strong. She's the strongest female stand-up to me out there, in my opinion. Now, it's funny when you when I say I don't think Tiffany's the funniest female out there, people will will twist your words to say I don't think Tiffany's funny. That's not what I said. I said I don't think she's the funniest female stand up in my opinion. Uh so now when people say she's the queen of comedy, and I think Jamie Foxx is the one. Jamie Foxx has really been all over Tiffany since Girls Trip because she was brilliant in that role. And that role led to a uh, basic open the doors for her completely. But you don't knock somebody's hustle for that. Uh, I, I like what Sinbad said on The Breakfast Club a while back. He was like, you know, I, when I get, I said, you know, again, he goes, when I don't get a role and I see guys younger than me or other people that I feel like I should have got it and they come up, he goes, I'm not mad at them for getting that because we're all chasing the same thing. So if you get something that I'm chasing, that just means it was meant for you. And I'm not going to hate on you because at the end, at the end of the day, Adrian Bronner, you're just trying to make a living and make money like other stand-ups are that move out to Hollywood and New York and try to make it. So you can't knock somebody else's hustle because they get a part that you was up for. Sometimes things are out of your control completely. I found out Tiffany had to audition for for uh, Girls Trip three times. They kept bringing her in because they wanted a big name and she wasn't a big name. And then she just had to keep bringing it. And he was like, all right, all right, she keeps bringing it. We're going to give it to her. And even when she, when I saw her on some of the award shows, Tiffany had said she was talking to the casting director. She goes, you know, I came in for you numerous times and didn't get parts. But the stars aligned and she was ready for this role in Girls Trip. And now she's taken off. But I think Kat was more talking about her stand up. She hasn't done a tour and things of that nature. Uh, now, he also went in on Lil Rel. He went in on Hannibal Burris and... Carmichael from, you know, Jared Carmichael from the Carmichael show. Uh, now, I get what he's saying when he talks about the good Jared Carmichael, especially that nobody's going to watch. Uh, I get, I you know, the same thing with the Carmichael show. I, I, I did a joke one time. I had a little rel on my Instagram and I said, he's on the best black sitcom that nobody's watching. And Lil Rel was like, what? And I think it's similar. I, I used to watch Carmichael show and it was it was brilliant. It was brilliant. Just like uh, Blackish is, is, I think Blackish has come a long way. Uh, but the Carmichael show, it never, it never resonated. It never stuck with at least the people I associate myself with and the people that I talk to. Uh, and I was like, so I, I think what Kat was saying was, can anybody name their favorite Carmichael episode from the Carmichael show? And you really can't. And Tiffany was on that show. Uh, Lil Rel was on that show. Now, Lil Rel, same thing. So you got a TV show and you got a guy named Lil Rel and you got a girl named Tiffany Haddish. And you, if you ask them, everybody be like, what? They was on that? Because it's for whatever reason, it just didn't hit and resonate. Uh, now, Lil Rel, supposedly amongst the, the novice comedy fans, hit with Get Out. But he was in a bunch of stuff before that. And now he's, he's taken off. We got Uncle Drew and he's passed some movies up. Now he's got Rel coming out on Fox. Now, I think Rel is going to be very similar to the Carmichael show, in my opinion. I think it's, you know, I just, I know Lil Rel and I know Sinbad's on it. 
and Jess Hilarious is on it and DC Young fights in it. So they casted a bunch of comedians, which I always think is smart. Cast comedians in there, put a couple actors in there, but put a couple comedians in a sitcom that you want to be funny because I think comedian's natural instinct is going to be correct most of the time rather than a writer. Have The, the writer should just be like, uh, the writer is almost like when you think of NFL team, he's like an offensive coordinator. They're just writing the plays down. You got to get athletes and you got to get ball players in there to deliver those lines. And I think comedians, we can we can see something funny and bring it to life more than people that aren't comedians. Uh, now bring in some seasoned actors to like facilitate it, keep that train rolling, almost like uh, NBA when you watch NBA on TNT. I mean, Shaq and Barkley are the best, and then Kenny Smith. But you got Ernie on there. Ernie's the guy that keeps that train rolling and brings it back together and grounds everybody. Uh, so I think with uh, with Rel Show, I think it's going to be similar to that. I think it's going to be similar to the Carmichael Show. I'm sure it's going to be good and great, but I don't think people are going to be like, whoa, got to watch uh, got to watch Rel this week. And, and, and that's just the state of, of TV, period. More people are on their phones and on Netflix, and there's so many outlets for people's attention span to go to. Sitcoms aren't what they used to be. It used to be that was that was the golden ticket. When I first got to L.A. in the late 90s, it was you got to get on a sitcom and you you felt like you made it. Now there's there's so many people on sitcoms and and you wouldn't even know it uh, just because there's so many other TV channels and things to watch. It's almost I mean, reality show people are more famous than people on sitcoms without question anymore. You whether be the 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 third lead in a reality show or the third lead in a sitcom. Third lead reality show, Real Housewives and Love and Hip Hop, those people, they're getting booked at club appearance, club appearances and stopped at airports more than the third lead of a sitcom. There's a guy out there now, uh, Tone Bell. Tone Bell opened for me in Dallas like 10 years ago. And he's funny dude. He's been on, I bet you, eight sitcoms in the past five years. He'll get on one and then he'll get canceled and they'll cast him in another one. And, and but Tone Bell at the airport won't get stopped hardly at all. And that guy's continually on a sitcom year after year after year. Damon Wayans Jr. Uh, in, in Hollywood, dude, they're beating down the door to work with that dude. He'll go sitcom to sitcom to sitcom to sitcom. But the novice comedy people and the people aren't in the industry will be like, Damon Wayans got a son? They wouldn't even know it. That's the state we're in right now. Just my reality show, I mean, it didn't, Here's the thing about my, my reality show, the Gary Owens show. We we premiered the same week as Insecure in Atlanta. I'm like two, basically, or what are be, what are what is really becoming iconic shows. Uh, I was up against. I was I was on the same time as ATL, same time. So I would get on Twitter and I'm trying to tweet about my show, and then I'd be like, "What the fuck is this Atlanta show?" Cause, cause that was trending everywhere. I go, who the fuck is Donald Glover? <laughs> Why is the Gary Owens show not trending? <laughs> I and just for for whatever reason, and you'll 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 go crazy trying to figure it out. It's just it is what it is. So why did Atlanta resonate? I don't know, but it did, and it resonated with the millennials. And I watched the show every week. I didn't watch it against my when my show was on, but trust I DVR and watch it. And then I have to watch my show 10 times to try to get the ratings of Atlanta. But that's the thing. Nowadays, sitcoms on network TV, as far as like Fox, ABC, CBS, NBC, I think it's you're getting a watered down version of what people really want. Where if you get on cable TV or you get on Netflix, you can almost hit them a little raw with things because Atlanta hits because I don't think they have as many, many eyes on it editing it. And the biggest complaint you'll ever hear amongst amongst sick people on sitcoms is they think they got something funny and good and a network exec will be like, nope, I don't like it. Take it out. We we went through that with uh with my I think it's every show you go through at. Even when I had the Gary Owen show on BET, we would get notes from from different people at BET and and one person be like, like, I got a note like this one time. So we send it off. And this lady at BET said, well, when Gary got baptized at the church, he moonwalked after he got out of the, the pool or the, the, the jacuzzi where I got baptized. He moonwalked out. 
that's going to be offensive to black people. And I was thinking, no, it isn't. I was, I was celebrating getting baptized. So I moonwalked out. That's just funny. I was like, sometimes I think execs and at networks, they have to give notes to validate their job. And I think that's why network sitcoms aren't as good as they could be. Uh, Cause there's too many people trying to validate themselves with notes that I don't, I would love to hear stories of writers and actors on sitcoms that's a, that it's turned in a script and a network said, great, shoot it. I don't think it's ever happened in the history of TV. I don't think anybody put in a sitcom went boom. Maybe not a sitcom, but maybe Shonda Rhimes. I heard Shonda Rhimes because she said such success in hit show after hit show. I heard she has a, has a uh, deal where you can't give notes. When she turns something in, but she, but she doesn't do sitcoms either. She does drama, and I can't speak on drama. I can just speak from people that I know that have been on sitcoms. They're like, God damn, we had something really funny, dude. And the networks gave notes, and now it's not as good. Uh, I you know, it's just it's the nature of the beast. But I like how uh, I like how Cat went on there and gave his honest opinion, whether I agree with it or not. Some things I agree with, some things I didn't. Uh, but whatever Cat does, it created a, uh, a firestorm, and now everybody's talking about Cat and everything. And then the funny shit is, so Cat goes back and forth with Wanda Smith on V103, and then her husband shows up at the comedy club where Cat was at uh, on Saturday and pulls out a gun on Cat. Uh, I'm like, dude, if you're in this comedian game, you're you know, if you play the dozen of somebody and you go back and forth on the radio, sometimes you'll get the best of them. Sometimes it'll get, get the best of you. And I don't know. I heard that Kat beelined it over to Wanda. The, now the story is Wanda showed up at Uptown Comedy Theater in Atlanta. Kat beelined it over to her and was like, I told you I would make you go viral. I told you. And like, I don't know if he got in her personal space or business, but her husband's like, just go on, man. It ain't about that. Just go on. Keep it moving. And Cat would. And he goes, dude, I'll jump you. Cat's not going to jump anybody, let's be honest. And if he is, what's he really going to do? I mean, he's not that big, dude. I don't know how big Wanda Sykes' husband is. I'm not. I'm sorry, not Wanda Sykes. Wanda Smith's husband is, but I'm sure he's bigger than Cat. So I guess they get in a verb argument, and then a gun got pulled, and I don't know what happened after that. I've heard different versions. But as a comedian, man, you got to have thick skin, and you and your spouse has has to have thick skin. It's, I mean, especially being a woman in this business, I can't even imagine being a, smou- a spouse to a female comedian because, you know, I said, you know, again, Jesus Christ, I'm going to get through this people one day. Uh, that just comes with it, man. You get bagged on a lot. That's what, that's the beauty. And that's why the Comedy Central roasts are so popular because they, they throw in what everybody's really saying about that person. But then they say, but it's not, you know, they're kidding too. I said, you know, again, Fuck. Uh, this is going to be called the, you know, podcast. Cause I say it so much. Uh, they, they throw in what people really said about that person. And then you throw in a little lighthearted jab, but then you'd be like, but we still love you, but we still love you. And I think that's what Kat was getting at with Tiffany was it's hard not to like Tiffany. I've known Tiffany for 18 years. You're around her. It's just hard not to like her. Same with Kevin. It's it. And that's the thing that, that Kat didn't bring up in this business. The likability is huge in this business. If you like somebody, you want to work with them. And and I think Tiffany's just so likable and her energy's positive and she grinded for so long and you could tell she's just appreciative of everything she's getting right now. So don't knock somebody's hustle, but I think people get it confused when Kat gives his honest opinion on things. Uh, and I think with Carmichael and Lil Rel and Hannibal Burris, he was saying... Networks are trying to make these guys movie stars and and TV stars. And he's like, but you don't know who they are. They sit around. You don't know who they are. Uh, But I I don't know. I think Kat was mainly commenting on the industry and not those individuals themselves. Because, you know, we always say there's there's people famous between the 405 and the 10. And that's where a lot of the studios are in Hollywood. And there's people that that the industry gives chance after chance after chance to be the lead in a sitcom, to be in a show and the show goes away and then they'll give them another chance and the show goes to give them another chance. And I think a lot of times comics frustrations go, God damn, man, I'm selling more tickets. 
I got a fan base. People want to see me on TV or they want to see me in movies and you keep casting the same people. Why don't they switch it up and give somebody else a chance? You drive yourself crazy thinking like that. You drive yourself crazy. Just I'll, I always said, I always listened to Bill Burr one time. I had a conversation with Bill Burr, Bill Burr at the airport. We just sat down bullshit and he just said, he goes, man, I'm just going to be so fucking funny. They can't deny me. I'm just going to be so funny. I said, I, I just need to hear that. I was like, yeah, man. I know I, I just try to be as funny as I can on the road, as funny I can when I get my my chances on TV and and you you hope one day somebody sees it, the right person sees it, and then they start putting you in stuff. And that, I mean, that's how I got the parts in uh, uh, Ride Along and Think Like a Man. I, I had a personal relationship with Will Packer. And I was like, you know, he, he thought I was funny, but he gave me a shot. And I, we also gave Kevin a shot. That's where Kevin just blew it out the water. But personal relationships are big in this business. Uh, so I, I was happy to see Kat go to the Emmys and then he like bowed down to Tiffany. And I think he probably, I don't know what he said. I don't want to put words in the cat's mouth, but he probably was saying, I didn't say you weren't funny. I was just saying, I didn't think you were the queen of comedy right now. And in there, I, I agree with Kat on that end. As far as stand up, Tiffany's funny, but I don't think she's the funniest out there to call her the queen of comedy. Uh, to me, Samore is the funniest female out there. That's just my opinion. But I'm not saying Tiffany isn't funny. I'm saying I don't think she's the funniest comedian, in my opinion. It's similar to like Margaret Cho and, and, and Janine Garoppolo. Every time I saw their stand-ups, I never got it. I was like, I don't get it. And I wouldn't laugh. But then I'd see people in the audience going nuts. And she's, they got both got fan bases. And I was like, I'm not knocking them. I'm not saying they're not funny. I'm just saying to me, I wouldn't pay to see them. Or to me, I don't think that, that that's not my type of humor. Uh, but there's people that I, my shit ain't their type of humor. I, I'm not stupid. There's a lot of people out there that are probably like, you know, Gary, I don't, I don't think that shit's funny. I get it. I mean, that's the beauty of comedy. You find your fan base and and you hopefully you build and you grow with your fan base and they tell more people and you bring them in and your your family just keeps growing and growing and growing and growing uh but you there's always going to be people that don't think you're funny that's just the nature of the beast there's no way there's not any comic out there that everyone's like yeah he's the best he's the big you are the more people are going to say you're not funny just as long look as long as people are talking about you that's the goal in this business Keep keep your I love when people say keep my name out your mouth. I'm like, no, keep my name all in your mouth. I want to be in your molars, your front teeth, your tongue, your esophagus. I want to be all in you. Keep my name in your mouth. Good or bad, keep it in your mouth. Every it's funny, every time I see an interview, what's funny is the internet that people constantly tell you you ain't funny. I'm like, dude, I get it, but you keep coming back to my page. You keep logging on, boosting my numbers. I'm cool with that. I'm perfectly okay with that. Uh, it's funny because though, though, those people that don't think you're funny make the most noise. That's what's funny. When people do think you're funny, they just make a quick comment. Hilarious. Funny shit. Good job. Love seeing you. The people that don't think you're funny write a fucking thesis to tell you why you're not funny. That's what's hysterical to me. People go into depth to tell you why you're not funny. But when you are funny, it's just ha ha, LOL, good shit. It's like one word. That, <laughs> it's just funny. That I think that's why we quote unquote call them haters. I think so. That's why people that we we address the the haters and people that don't like us so much is because they go into such detail why they don't like you. But then the people that do like you don't go into detail why they do like you. They just be like, we like you. That's enough said. You don't have to explain why you like somebody. Uh, so. I always, I, you know, I've got no problem with Kat. I got no problem with Tiffany, Lil Ro, Carmichael. I try to be cool with everybody. None of them's ever done anything uh, to me ever. And so far, I don't think a comedian's ever said I'm not funny. But I'm sure people have said it behind closed doors. Uh, all right, y'all. Uh, look, I'm going to end this with peace and love. Kat, Tiff, Lil Rel, Gerald Carmichael, Kevin Hart, Mike Epps. I want to quote Rodney King. Can't we all just get along? <laughs> There's enough for everybody out there. This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. If you want to listen to my podcast, just go to iTunes, search Gary Owen, hashtag Get Some. <laughs>